know about that? Yes, sure. Uh, my wife and I are going to Taiwan in September. We're going to, originally we were going to go to Taipei, but we're now going to a smaller city called Tainan, which is near the south, uh, down in the south of ta uh, Taiwan. And my wife is going to study Chinese. She's actually a Chinese teacher. Mm. But her goal is to get to a level of Chinese where she can interpret a sermon into Chinese with no notes. Mm. So anyone who's done translation knows that if you don't have notes and you're translating into your mm. second or third mm. language in her case, mm. that's quite difficult. So we're going, we're going for her to for her to study and I'll also uh, study Chinese as well and look to do some missionary work too. Wow, wow, that sounds amazing. Oh. And it's um, you know, totally out of your comfort zone as well, I guess, in, in some respect, out of your yes. current life now. So yes. It's uh, amazing challenges. It is, yeah. it is. Well, my understanding is Tainan in the summer actually gets quite humid mm. and coming from New Zealand I'm not really mm. used to humidity but at least Sydney is, has prepared mm. me for that somewhat. Okay, very good, very good. Um, so Lord, we pray that uh, Pastor Alec and his wife uh, goes to Taiwan and be able to be a, a great blessing to the community there, missionary work and teaching, translation and Lord, be with them throughout this whole process and even today, give Pastor Alec the wise words to let us know of your life, Lord, the life that you want us to live. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, James. Well, good morning and welcome to church. Uh, it is a very, uh, feels like a definitely international congregation is the right feel, especially with our guests from all over the world. So a special welcome to you also. I'd like to begin with uh, sharing a story. I... I have a grandfather who fought in the Second World War. He uh, was with the RAF, so the Royal Air Force the, out of the UK, and he flew in uh, Wellington, a Wellington bomber. He was the navigator, and during the war he actually got shot down and uh, was blinded for a few months, so he, sp he spent the rest of the war, uh, the Second World War, in a hospital recovering uh, his sight. And so I had uh, my grandfather who did that, and his brother also fought with the RAF. He was a fighter pilot, but unfortunately for him, he was shot down and killed over France during the Second World War. So for me, I grew up with this kind of this legacy, and it, it meant that I actually had quite an interest in the Second World War, in particular, Second World War planes. And I uh, I had such an interest that I actually tried to follow in my grandfather's footsteps and join the Air Force as a navigator, but unfortunately I was not successful, so I did not uh, go into uh, become a, uh, a navigator in the New Zealand Air Force. But I still was fascinated with planes, and I actually had a poster on my bedroom wall and it had three F-15 eagles flying along above the clouds and below it actually had the verse, Deuteronomy 20 verse 4. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. So for today, for, for our sermon, we're going to be looking at this passage that was just read out, Deuteronomy 20 verses 1 to 4, but with special reference to verse 4, which is what, I just, uh, what was just read out and what we will be looking at in more depth. So the first point I'd like to make from this passage is that God goes with us. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. So we see that in verse 4, and the priest, their role before the Israelites get sent out into battle, he is to tell them these words, because he is to say, Hear, Israel, today you are going into battle against your enemies. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not, be, do not panic or be terrified by them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. So this is where the people of Israel were, were at. They were about to enter into the promised land because Deuteronomy 
is a book of speeches or one long speech, depending on how you look at it, of Moses to the people because Moses has led Israel out of Egypt and they're about to approach the promised land, but he has been told by God that he will not enter. And there's a very sad chapter at the end of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, where there's the transition where Moses dies and the people of Israel mourn and then Joshua takes over as the leader of Israel. So the book of Deuteronomy is Moses giving his speeches to the people of Israel and he gives them these instructions of what to do before going into battle. What should they do? Now one of the problems that the people of Israel had was fear. The Israelites sent spies into the land to to map it out to see what it was like and they came back with a report and 10 of the spies said, They've got giants. It's going to be too hard for us. Only two of the spies, Joshua and Caleb, said, well, they're right, but we have a God who can do it, who can help us to win the battle. But the people of Israel did suffer from fear, hence why the priest is meant to say, before you go into battle, do not be afraid. And therefore, every time they went into battle, there was this reminder to them that God is with them. This was why they were not to fear. And to also from this verse in Isaiah 41, God continues to remind his people, not just after the promised land is conquered by Israel, not just after that, but later on, God continues to remind his people to not fear. He says this in Isaiah 41.10, Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So for the people of Israel, they struggled with fear. For people later on, after the promised land was conquered, they too struggled with fear as well. And maybe many people today also struggle with the issue of fear. What are the things that you might be afraid of? What are things that you fear Well, and here in Isaiah, we are told to not fear because we too have God with us, just as the Israelites did back in the times of Moses. Therefore, it is a partnership. It is a partnership that we have with God because we are not to be afraid because God is with us. There is that bond, there is that connection that we have to a God who truly loves us and wants to be with us and protect us. So God partners with us, and that is the point here of this passage, is that the people of Israel, they were still to go out and fight the battle. God could have done it all on his own. He could have just wiped out all of the promised land, all the people from it, with just one word. Yet he chose to partner with the people of Israel. He chose to partner with people who struggled with fear, who struggled with doubt, who probably would have wanted to run away when they step up to the battlefield and see armies much greater and much stronger than them. So they struggled with fear, but they were in partnership with the most powerful God that they followed. So therefore, they were not to be afraid, because sure, their numbers might be small, but they were partnering with an amazing God who had more than enough power to be able to help them be victorious in battle. And then when you read through the book of Joshua, you actually see that where Israel again and again and again conquered the peoples of the promised land. So there is this partnership that God has with his people. And that partnership also continues today with us. We are in partnership with God. God also could just bring about our salvation probably uh, by sending his angels, for example. One of the American pastors, Bayless Connolly, said, if, I, if I'm ever made a suggestion of, to God of how to do things differently, I would tell him that maybe instead of getting your people to be evangelists, why don't you just get all the angels to go and knock on people's door and tell them to follow God? Because his thinking was that would probably be far more effective if you'd open your front door to a fiery angel telling you to believe in God and follow him. And so his idea was that, uh, Bayless Connolly's idea, was that that would probably 
be more successful, but instead what he was saying, though, is God chooses to be in partnership with us. There is a work that God is doing here on this earth, and that is the work of redemption. And so he chooses us to be in partnership with him to bring salvation to people. We are called as Christians to go and share the love of God with those in this world who do not yet know it. We are in partnership. Again, God could do that all on his own, but he chooses not to. He instead chooses us to work with him so that people might be saved. That is such an amazing responsibility and pretty scary as well. But again, God does not send us out and say, go and do this all on your own, because again, he is in partnership with us. He is working with us. He never leaves us or forsakes us. He goes with us wherever we go in this world. And as for the missionaries that continue to be prayed for, they get sent into this world partnering with God, because there is nowhere in this world that God is not. So wherever we go to share God's word, he is there with us, helping us along the way. Because again, it is a partnership. It is a partnership that we are called to, to be in partnership with God. St. Augustine said these words, Pray like it all depends on God. Work like it all depends on you. So again, there is that idea that it is something that we are doing together with God. Because when we pray, we know that God is completely powerful and we know for us in our broken and our fallen state that we constantly make mistakes, we constantly stuff things up, whether it be in ministry or daily life, so we realise we cannot do anything without our God. And so we ask him and say, Lord, it all depends on you. I really need you to be involved and to help me to do what I'm meant to do. So we cannot do it at all without God because it all depends on him. Without him, we are nothing. But then when we go into work, when we go into ministry, we give it 101%, as we heard in our children's talk. We give it our everything because it does depend on us. God says, okay, yes, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it with you. And so we go out and we serve and we give our lives to our Heavenly Father, to our Saviour who saved us from, from ourselves and from hell. So we are sent out because we are in partnership with God. And we should not be afraid because when we go, we go with him. Just as the people of Israel, when they went out, they should not be afraid because they had God with them also. The next point is that God fights for us. God fights for us. And we see that again in the book of Joshua. God constantly bringing victory to the people of Israel. God goes with them and fights for them. And I actually, one of the things I like about this verse in Deuteronomy 20 verse 4 is, is the connection to the word you or your. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. So we have the sense that God fights for us. And that's what happened to the people in, of Israel. They had a God fighting for them. They had the most powerful God bringing them victory because they followed him. But then we read through the Old Testament and we see that. And one of the criticisms that many people have of the Bible is that it is very violent. There is a lot of God-sanctioned battle, God-sanctioned warfare of where men, women, and children are killed. And so we have a God in the, in the Old Testament who does a lot of fighting and his people do a lot of fighting also. So this is something that people struggle with when they go through the Old Testament, the, the amount of violence. And how do we respond to that, especially as Christians when we have Jesus' teachings on the Sermon on the Mount of Matthew 5.39? If someone slaps you on the right cheek, turn him the other cheek also. So how do we reconcile the teaching of the Old Testament seeing this God who calls his people to fight, and then we have the teaching of the New Testament 
that calls us that when we are attacked to not be provoked, to not retaliate. How do we reconcile the two teachings? Well, one way that we can look at that is who are our enemies? And the song before, Onward Christian Soldiers, gave it away. But I'd like to read to you Ephesians 6 verse 12. For we are not fighting against human beings, but against the wicked spiritual forces in the heavenly world, the rulers, authorities, and cosmic powers of this dark age. So God is the same God that he was yesterday, that he is today, and will be tomorrow. But the enemies have changed. In the Old Testament, the people of Israel were called into battle against the enemies of their day, which were the people who inhabited the promised land, the land of Canaan. But today, our enemies are not the same. We are not to go and do what the Israelites did and go and invade the Middle East. No, our enemies are spiritual forces. Or more specifically, I I believe sin is the greatest enemy to any Christian. Sin is our enemy that we constantly fight because it is sin, as uh, in the book of James chapter 1, that leads to death. So sin is something that we fight. We definitely fight the powers and principalities, but their goal, their desire is to see us, God's people, sin. That is what they want. So for us, our fight is to say, Lord, I really want to sin. Lord, help me not to sin. Help me to resist temptation. Help me to not give in to my worldly desires of what I want to do. Help me to remain obedient to what you've called me to do. That is what God is calling us to fight. We are not fighting people. They are not our greatest enemy. Our greatest enemy is the evil one who wants us to sin. So therefore, that is where God is actually, when we apply Deuteronomy 20 verse 4, to us as Christians, then we think, okay, God is not going with us to fight for us against our enemies which happen to be people he's going with us to fight for us against our enemies which happen to be sin so when we read it in that context for us as christians today we realize oh great i actually do have an enemy that i want to defeat that i want to see finished so that is for us as christians we don't want sin to reign in our lives we want to be overcomers We want to be people who follow our God. A Christian author by the name of John Eldridge writes this. He says, Evil typically doesn't yield its hold willingly. It must be forced to surrender or be destroyed. So this is an enemy that we desire to see be destroyed, the evil in our lives. It is something that when we call on God to help us, to fight for us, this is what he is fighting against, the evil, the sin in our lives. The final point from this last part of this verse is that God gives us the victory. God gives us the victory. And you actually... See, for the Israelites, when they conquered Canaan, they were given the victory. They overcame the Canaanites. Now, they didn't completely get rid of everyone, and that led to a lot of problems later on for the people of Israel, who started following the idols of the people who remained. But in general, it is fair to say that they were victorious. They inhabited the promised land. And so, for the people in the book of Joshua, when they had this passage read to them, they went out into battle fighting against enemies who numbered much greater than than them, but they were still victorious because they had God with them. So that would have been, I imagine, a great uh, thing for the priest to say, a great team talk, if you like, for people who who need to be encouraged to maybe their, their courage is starting to fail them, And then the priest says these things. When you hear Israel today, you are going into battle against your enemy. Do not be faint-hearted or afraid. Do not panic or be terrified by them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you. 
against your enemies to give you victory. So to me, when I, when I read this, I think this is one of the greatest team talks ever. It's one of the greatest speeches. Is don't worry, you can go out and fight, and when you go, God will be with you, and you will have victory. I remember um, my first match of club rugby in New Zealand, and being completely scared because I saw the other team and they were much bigger than I was. And I remember the team talk beforehand and standing between two friends who I went to youth group with, both who are about a foot taller than me and much more solid than I am, and feeling afraid. But when the person gave the team talk and they said, look at the people around you, these are the people you are going to play this game with, and I looked at one friend and then the other, and I was like, yeah, actually, I do feel encouraged. I do feel like we can go out and win this game. But here, in Deuteronomy, the priest is giving this encouraging speech, and rather than looking around at the people that they were going into battle with, they didn't have to do that. All they had to do was look up and know that they had a powerful God, their loving Heavenly Father, who was going with them into battle. And the book of Joshua is the result of people looking to God and seeing him going with them to give them victory. So what about victory for us? What does that look like? Well, if sin is what we're fighting against, then victory comes through being obedient. Obedience is our victory. When we are challenged with temptation, but we choose to follow God's ways and what God sets before us, then we are victorious because we are obedient. That is the purpose of our fight that we are going into. We are supposed to fight against powers and principalities, and we win through being obedient. And Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. So if we are to love God, we are to show that we are followers of him and we become victorious. It is by keeping his commandments. We want to be obedient because we love God. We don't want to let him down. We don't want to fail. We don't want to sin. But we do it with God helping us every step of the way. We have God who wants us to be successful and he helps us to be obedient. And then Romans 8 verse 37 says this, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. So first of all, we are conquerors because we see Jesus' death on the cross enabling us to go and spend eternity in heaven. So we are conquerors in that Jesus has won the battle and we get to celebrate and uh, have the consequences of that result. We get to go to heaven. That is a a victory for us, even though it was Jesus who did all the work. So we share in that victory. But we are also conquerors because Jesus helps us. He is our partner in overcoming sin and overcoming temptation that is in our lives. So for us, we are conquerors because Jesus helps us to defeat the evil one who wants to see us fail. And then God partners with us in this way, as John Eldridge again says. Our God is a warrior because there are certain things in life worth fighting for, must be fought for. He makes man a warrior in his own image because he intends for man to join him in that battle. So we join with God in the battle against sin. And when God is with us and we are obedient, then we are victorious. We are also more than conquerors. So that is the whole point of this, of us when we look at the Old Testament and we see things of the Old Testament that the people of Israel did where they defeated physical enemies. For us, we see that and realize God is also a God who wants to be victorious with us. But it's not against people. It's against the evil one. It's against sin. It's against temptation. That is the whole point. One thing, though, I'd like to finish on is this idea. It's interesting that God fights for us to give us the victory. Because if you think about it, you'd 
you think as Christians, shouldn't we believe that God is the one who's victorious, not us? Especially since he's done all the work and he's the one who's all conquering. But instead, the passage says to give you victory, not God victory. And I believe it relates to us when we come to worship God, when we come to praise him. We say, God, you are worthy of our praise. You are all conquering. You are the the great king. But yet we are the ones who get all the benefits. So why is that? Because surely we praise God, don't we praise God for him? Well, I believe there is God up in heaven and he cannot get any stronger or any weaker, no matter what. He is all powerful and nothing, nothing will ever change that. If everyone in the world started praising God or everyone in the world stopped praising him, that would not change who God is. He will remain the same. There is, there is no armies, there are no anything in the universe that can come against God and make him any weaker because he will always be powerful. So for people who don't under, understand, they think, oh, God is someone maybe he has low self-esteem because people are required to keep praising, praising him, keep worshipping him. But no, it's, it's nothing to do with that at all. It is for us. It is for us. It is just like how we are given victory. Well, when we come and we praise God, it is good for us to praise God because he is in a place of holiness. But when we praise him, we are drawn to that place as well. We understand where God is at. And for us, that lifts us up. That helps us to go out and continue to be victorious. God doesn't need the trophies of war or anything when he goes into battle for us. He is helping us to be victorious because we are the ones who know defeat. We are the ones who can be beaten. So God fights for us so that we can be victorious, so that we can overcome the evil one. Therefore, let us go out into this world asking God to be involved in our struggles to be involved with the fight that we constantly have each day against sin. And God does it not so that he can be greater, but so that we can be successful, so that we are the ones who can overcome because we are the ones who can be defeated. Therefore, let us bow our heads and finish in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you are so amazing. You are so holy. You are our great Heavenly Father who loves us so much. And there is nothing in this universe that can defeat you. We thank you, Lord, that in all your splendor, in all your majesty, you chose us, people who are broken, people who fail, who make mistakes. You chose us to be your children. And I, for one, am eternally grateful for that. Lord, help us. Help us to call on you when we struggle with sin, when we struggle with temptation. Help us to call you to come and fight for us so that we may be victorious. We thank you that you love us so much, that you made a way through your son, Jesus Christ, that we can have that connection with you, that we can call on you for help as a child calls on their heavenly Father. So, Lord, we do thank you and praise you for all the things that you have done and how great and mighty you are. We praise you in the name of Jesus Christ.